I think that one of the costs of the war at home is the cost to our freedom and our Constitution. And in military intelligence, there are specific guidelines, and one of those specific guidelines that's supposed to govern how we conduct ourselves is a guideline called USID 18, which stands for United States Signals Intelligence Directive 18, which says that in an effort to uphold Americans' constitutional rights, military intelligence cannot collect on Americans. And to show the seriousness which we took this directive, in 1997 or thereabouts, I intercepted a radio transmission of a Middle Eastern military entity which referenced the name of an American diplomat that was visiting the Middle East. Because an American's name was referenced, we decided to delete every single record that that cut was ever collected. It wasn't even directly collecting on an American, but just a reference. And maybe that was something that we didn't necessarily have to do, but we took our oath to not collect on Americans very seriously. And so we erased every single record that that cut ever took place. After 9-11, when I was activated, I was again stationed at the same field site for the NSA in the States. And I was assigned not to collect radio transmissions of Middle Eastern military entities, but Inmarsat satellite phone calls from Iraq, Afghanistan, and a huge swath of that region. And initially, all of the cuts, this is a brand new system. Why they put 20 reservists in charge of it, I will never know, with virtually no oversight whatsoever, which was another problem. But in the beginning, we were getting all these cuts, which were unidentified. It was a brand new system. It was just we had a front end out there. It was collecting all these satellite phone conversations, sending it back to the United States. And we would go through and just listen randomly through all these unidentified cuts, just kind of like fishing for whatever we could find. And as time passed, I saw in, in this computer system you could, once you identify the telephone number, who it belongs to, you can actually program the computer to pop up with the name of whatever group belongs to it and the priority for whatever priority the cut is. So for instance, priority one would have been a terrorist affiliated organization. As time passed, I saw our queue not fill up so much with anything that had anything to do with terrorism but um, humanitarian aid organizations, NGOs, and even to include journalists. And this was not by any means like the majority of the cuts we collected, but even after we knew that it was the International Red Cross Red Crescent, rather than block their phone number, which we could have done, we continued to collect and these are the two reasons we were given that allowed us to collect on these organizations. One was that these people um, were eyes on the ground. And as they were going through Iraq, they might happen upon weapons of mass destruction and give their location. So we could monitor them in case they ever referenced the location of WMDs. The other reason was that they could potentially, the organization could potentially lose their phone and it could be picked up by a terrorist and then they would start using it. So we had to make sure that no terrorist ever secured the phone of another, of another organization then started using it. We had to maintain um, coverage on those phone numbers just in case. And this kind of came to a head for me in probably sometime in the beginning to middle of 2002 when I was listening to a conversation between a British aid worker and American aid worker um, in the area. And they weren't talking about anything of particular relevance. They were talking about whatever was going on in their office. It was so irre irrelevant that I can't really remember what the conversation was about. But what I do remember is that the British aid worker said to the American, you know, you really should be careful what you say on the phone because the Americans are listening. And the American 
rightly thinking that um, he was protected from being monitored by our government, said, no, they can't protect again, they can't collect against me because I'm an American citizen and I'm protected by USIT 18. And when he referenced USIT 18, I, I don't know why, but that just kind of, because it's military intelligence lingo, I thought that that might be of some relevance. Um, either the person was prior military, which is probably very likely and was familiar with what was going on, or come to find out, most aid workers working outside of our country know about use at 18 because they know their use at 18 by rights are being violated all the time by our government. Wow. Um, I drew that cut to the um, attention of my officer in charge and he related to the watch office and everybody actually got into a mini uproar because this American referenced use at 18 to a non-American and they acted as if this American had just enacted some form of like treason by referencing USIT 18 to a British, an ally, supposedly um, person. So shortly after that, um, there was all this hubbub about whether or not we can collect on Americans, whether or not USIT 18 is actually even relevant anymore, whether or not we should be monitoring these NGOs. And they consulted whoever they is, I don't know. Um, I was in my little spot where I was told I was a collector and I wasn't allowed to um, ask questions about anything. I couldn't analyze, I couldn't ask questions. My job was to collect and pass the information on. And it was shortly thereafter that we were told that we were given a waiver that we could collect on Americans in the Middle East. And this included conversations that took place with people in the Middle East calling their family members in the United States. And we could hear both sides of the conversation, but we were told that in order to protect the Americans in the United States, we would just not report on their half of the conversation. Even though we were collecting it, even though we were listening to it, we would just not add that to the report. Why it matters where an American is in this world as to whether or not their rights are protected by our Constitution, I do not know. But apparently, um, is, I've been kind of somewhat reviewing all the changes that are happening to military intelligence and FISA law. All this is no longer just a matter of a verbal waiver, it's all legal. And that our government is using these occupations to destroy our constitutional rights as Americans is personally, I think, impeachable, but in any reference, criminal. I could kind of go through uh, some of the different instances that happened where I feel that information was collected, which we could have very well known it was misinformation. We passed it on anyway. But I think more importantly, I want to just speak to the fact that it is not only our soldiers, Marines, National Guard reservists, airmen and women fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan that are supporting these wars. It is every single member of the military, whether or not you are stateside, whether or not you are abroad, whether or not you are intercepting transmissions in country. By serving in the military, we are all supporting the occupations. And I just think that's really incredibly important for us all to recognize because people always want to look and put so much on the shoulders of our veterans who have witnessed so much in Iraq and Afghanistan and act as if they are the only ones that have to bear the burden of ending these occupations. But I, for one, having served many years before 9-11 and before Afghanistan and before Iraq, am so sorry that through my service, I, in any way, shape, or form, supported the initiation of wars, which puts you all 
in such horrible, horrible, horrible positions.